Long Range Shooters of Utah. We have the pleasure here at SHOT Show 2017 to be with Mr. George Gardner. If you don't know who he is, he is the <laughs> owner of GA Precision, which is uh, really the biggest and most widely known and one of the best precision rifle builders in the country. Um, so uh, you guys have built rifles for, I mean, didn't you guys do the rifle for Chris Kyle or the tribute yeah. rifle at least? So I don't know about all that, but thank you for the accolades. Um, we did build all the guns for Chris Kyle's shooting school. Okay. And one of Chris's favorite guns, once he got out of the military, was our Gladius rifle. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the one that's in the movie is actually here with us in the SHOT Show today. Very cool. Very cool. So what I want to do is a little bit uh, unorthodox. Instead of just coming in and talking about the rifles, the beautiful rifle these guys build, which we'll get to, I wanted to ask George just a couple of key questions that we hear a lot on Facebook uh, from newer shooters. So things like, how do you properly break in a barrel? Um, you know, what's the best caliber for me to get started if I'm only going to buy one rifle right now? You know, what caliber should I get? What rifle should I get? Uh, what factory rifle? If I can't afford a custom rifle, where should I start out with? Things like that. So uh, one of the questions that I personally would love to hear your answer on, I have my own answer, okay. would be uh, how do you advise your clients to break in a barrel? If they get a custom gun built, how do you advise them to break in that barrel? So all the guns, when we ship out, we send an instruction for cleaning and break-in. Okay. There's a couple really critical things that I always like to talk about. Every barrel breaks a little bit differently. I can tell you there are some barrels that really don't need any break-in. There's some barrels that need a little bit of break-in. So the, the key is, if you don't know how to tell that, which most new shooters are not, to just do a simple break-in procedure that'll you know, keep your barrel from loading up with carbon or loading up with copper and not actually seasoning like they're supposed to. Um, I like to call it seasoning a barrel more than breaking it in because what you're doing is when you're shooting around through the barrel the first few shots, you're burnishing the edges of the rifling. Keep in mind that that tube was machined, lapped on most cut rifles, lap, and then machined in the rifling and then lap again. So you have a lot of edges that had an abra a very fine abrasive to them. So when you start shooting, the really fine residue that's left by the carbon and the, and the bullet going down seasons the bore and leaves a burnish, which I can tell you is like a little hardened crust on top of the rifling that you want there, but you want it to get on in there uniform so you don't get that buildup of copper and carbon that's so hard to remove and might affect accuracy. Okay, perfect. So, and maybe you can explain lapping for some of the, the newer shoes. Sure, so when the barrel's finished or halfway through after uh, drilling and reaming, they pour about a four, two to four inch lead lap. So they put a rod in through the bottom of the barrel, they pour lead in over a little jag that holds the lead on the jag, then they push it out the end and let it cool, which is really important because you don't want, when it's warm, it's oversized. So you push it out until it cools. Then they use an abrasive paste. It's um, not like flits or something you normally see for cleaning. It's more abrasive than that, but it breaks down. They will coat that lead, pull it back in the bore, and give even long strokes along the whole entire bore, uh, taking off any rough edges, any machine marks that are left in there by the cutting tools, and just giving it a nice smooth finish. Um, I could probably go on and on and on about the re different reasons for it, but like on button rifle barrels, sometimes they're not uniform. They'll hit soft spots in this bore, and one size will be a little bit smaller than others. When they lap it, the size becomes consistent. Okay. Uh, cut rifle barrels, because your cutting material may be a little bit more apt to having machine marks or sharp edges. So on a cut rifle barrel that's going to be perfect size, you're just removing those edges and smoothing the barrel out. Okay. And out of those different options, button versus cut, what do you typically prefer? Um, I, we prefer cut rifle barrels just because I know how consistent the bore can be. Um, I will not ever say that button rifles are bad because the, the good ones can be really good. Um, there's even companies that are kind of morphing the two processes together, which is interesting. That's kind of a new technology. Don't know where that's going yet, but okay. um, there's not a bad versus good on that. It's just if they're done right, they're both really good you know, barrels. Okay. So the typical guy that buys a precision rifle, what would be the really basic kind of Reader's Digest version of a break-in process that you would recommend? So our, our process is fairly simple. When you get the gun, clean it. Uh, go to the range, shoot a round. Normally when you go to the range with your first gun, you're, you don't have it sighted in anyway, so you've got some stuff you got to do anyway. So clean sheet of paper, bore sight it, take your shot, you see where it went. Go ahead and clean the gun, make that correction on the, on the scope to get you closer to center. Uh, take the second shot, fine tune it a little bit more, give it a quick cleaning. By now you're going to be really close to having the gun zeroed, hopefully. Take your third shot, hopefully you're, you're right in there. 
then go ahead and clean once more. You've got three shots now with three cleanings. And by this time, you're like probably Jones and to see how the gun's gonna shoot. Shoot yourself a three shot group. You know, tune it up, tune up the placement of it one more time. You know, give yourself a high five for that group you just shot. Clean it one more time. If we're time. shooting your rifles, yeah. Yeah, clean it one more time. Um, I, another thing I guess I should add in is a lot of guys forget you're doing all this cleaning and the most most likely you're getting some residue into the chamber. The most important thing is to swab that chamber out and get it really dry between cleanings. Okay. A lot of guys will call saying that they had excessive pressure and it's because they're leaving residue in yeah. the chamber during breaking. And what kind of solvents or lubricants do you use? Are you running a dry patch through? Or are you doing a wet patch with a particular right. solvent? Uh, a brush? A, a wet patch to start and okay. then a nylon brush and then wet patches and then dry. Is there any reason at all you should ever use a brass brush? No reason whatsoever. Okay. Uh, the, only time, the only time we use uh, bronze brushes, not brass, Sorry. is uh, is if, let's say you went to a couple matches, didn't clean in between, and you notice a buildup of carbon in the throat mm -hmm. area, just scrubbing that throat out with a bronze brush and a good cleaner it's probably the only time I ever use bronze. Okay. And then what about your cleaning process? So you as a competitor in your rifles, how often do you clean? What caliber are you shooting, first of all? Because if it's really overboard, you're probably going to be more likely to clean than Correct. like a 308, right? I, so maybe I you actually, can explain. I shoot two different calibers. I've been shooting a 6 millimeter variant for years, as long as I've been shooting. Currently, I shoot the 6 Creed more. I think it's a great caliber. It's faster than other 6 millimeters. Super accurate. My other caliber I like to shoot is the 6.5 SOM, or I guess we're calling it the 6.5 GAP 4S now. Mm -hmm. uh, I shoot that in longer range competitions if I know there's a lot of shooting over a thousand yards. If it's a thousand and in six degree more, if there's a lot of shots over a thousand, I'll shoot the SOM. Um, as far as which one I pick, it's literally how, what type of match and how far the target's going to be. As far as cleaning goes, I won't clean during the match because you normally don't have a chance in the morning each day to, to re-zero the gun and foul it in. So, you know, most matches are a little bit of uh, pre-shooting and then the match, and then you're looking at maybe the maximum of 300 rounds. I always like to clean my gun when I get back to the shop. Hmm. So I would say between matches is normally when I clean. If I did a heavy training day and shot two, 300 rounds, I'm gonna clean. I guess the best rule of thumb is I'd clean before the 500 round mark. Okay. The guys that go shoot a couple boxes at the range and clean every night or clean excessively at the range once the gun's broke in, it's, it's really unnecessary. Okay. And what about guys that just say, don't bother cleaning at all? Well, I, I'm not a purveyor of that for several, several reasons. Most guys are shooting brakes now, especially in competition shooting. The carbon that comes out of the bore hits the baffles of those brakes and eventually it closes in. And I've seen way more times than I'd like to see where bullets are actually going through that carbon in the brake and causing accuracy problems. Huh. I've taken brakes off where it looks like there's a silencer baffle in the back of the brake and it's just a buildup of carbon completely around with a bullet right through the center. Okay, it's, interesting. Uh, the brake's really important to clean, the crown's important to clean. The bore, once it's broke in, really doesn't change, but we're talking about the throat area that does, the, the bullet passes through, there's no rifling, there's a lot of powder behind it, that area can get a lot of copper in it. And I'm sure you've heard people talk about uh, a donut or a carbon donut or a carbon ring, that's mm -hmm. where it builds up. Okay. And if you're not constantly watching that and, and keeping that from building up, you might get accuracy or pressure problems and not understand them. So okay. I do say, you need a bore scope to take a look at that? Well, or is it something the typical guy is going to be able to see? I mean, I don't need a bore scope to know it's there. When a gun starts acting funny, I know what, what what's causing it. Um, but yes, to for me to show you, if you didn't know what it was, what it looks like, I would need a bore scope. Okay. The best the best rule of thumb is clean, you know, every 500 rounds or so, and you're not going to have that problem. Okay. And uh, for the newer shooters, explain fouling. So a lot of guys they think, oh, I'll clean my rifle and it'll shoot really great. Right. But those first five, 10, 15 shots, whatever, may not shoot as well and might frustrate guys. So they explain fouling. They necessarily won't shoot. It's not that they won't shoot as well. They might shoot actually really well, but the the you're going to have faster faster rounds once you put a few rounds to it. So the first few shots will normally be slower than once there's a little powder root build up that actually causes a little resistance on the bullet. Um, that's why if you shot high power or F-class or Palma, they always allow ciders basically to foul the bore, get a little bit warm before you start shooting for record. Okay. Um, 
they don't allow that in PRS shooting most of the time. So the, basically, if you bring a clean board to the range, you're shooting on a very clean surface that's not going to have as much resistance or friction. As soon as you've shot it a few times, you're going to get that, I don't want to call it a buildup, but you're going to get a film of residue that's left behind from the bullet and or the powder, and the gun will shoot more consistent because now it's, you know, it's where it's going to be throughout the whole the whole match. Okay. I guess is the best way to explain it. Okay, interesting. So about every four or five hundred rounds, how does that change from say a 308 to a 65 SOM that's really overboard? Um, it, the overboard board, meaning that you've got a lot of powder right. behind a little tiny hole. Right. It, it, you just explained it the best way with your statement. You know, 223 has roughly 23 to 28 grains of powder, depending on what powder. Uh, 308 40 grains to 45 grains, you know, SOM 60 grains, 300 mid mag 70 grains, Lapua is 80 grains. So it's just a percentage. You got more powder that can do more fouling with each shot. Mm -hmm. So that's the easiest way to explain it. The bigger the bore, the more powder you're throwing through it, the more powder that can build up in the brake, the suppressor, all across the board. It's just just more of what what's going down the bore. Okay. So more overboard, you're going to clean it more often. So if you're shooting the SOM, is it still about 500 rounds, or would you say For, for me, sooner? it's all the same. No. All the same, okay. Uh, rule of thumb is 500 rounds for me. I, I would never tell anyone to overclean, and I'm not one of the guys that tells people you're going to never clean. You could technically get away with cleaning the chamber, cleaning your brake, you know, maybe brushing it, brushing the chamber or right in front of the chamber out a little bit and then running a couple patches through and being done. Okay. That's still a cleaning, it's just not a big healthy cleaning. So I know a lot of guys, when they clean, they'll use like a, uh, what's the Barnes, the uh, QR, t the 10, what is it called? It's the solvent. CR10. CR10, that's right. right. So they'll take it and run that through the brush and scrub, 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 right. scrub until they get no blue. And what right. is your typical after match cleaning process well, those, look like? Those type of solvents are attacking copper, or attacking carbon. So mm -hmm. scrubbing doesn't necessarily do anything. If you've ever had mud on your boots, and you try to scrub at it when it's dry, of course it doesn't do anything. When you put it under some water and you start scrubbing, initially you're having a hard time working through it. But if you let it soak mm -hmm. Break it down. and then pull it out and scrub it like falls off. That's the same thing with those type of cleaners. You know, clean the exterior with a nylon brush, wet patch, let that stuff sit in there for a while. Don't be afraid of it. They, st they store this stuff in stainless steel containers when they make it. It does not erode steel. Okay. So let it soak for an hour. Go, you know, if you're at home at night after work, go drink a couple of beers, watch the TV, then come back, and all that stuff's going to come out real easy. Okay. So you'll run, do you do run it through until it doesn't come out blue, or you just give it a few until you feel like it's pretty good and call it good? You'll see it, and, and keep in mind, you'll get a false blue with some jag. Some jags, the jag itself will cause it to turn mm -hmm. blue. Mm -hmm. uh, Bortec makes products that don't turn the patches blue. I, I pretty much told people to use Bortec because I know their products won't give you that false blue. I mean, their their jags or their their jags brushes. are made out of okay. a, a material that does not dissolve in that. Mm -hmm. In that, you know, if they made jags in stainless, they'd start, you know, hurting barrels. So they always make them in a softer material. That material they use, whatever it is, does not turn blue. Okay. But I do patch until I get a light to almost nothing blue. Okay. Normally on a good barrel that's been seasoned properly and made by a good manufacturer, that's going to happen very quick. Okay. Some factory barrels that aren't lapped or lap, you know, not worth it, you know, not worth even calling it lapping, mm -hmm. might take a little bit longer. Okay, perfect. And when you're doing the cleaning, are you using a, a bore guide and Correct. running it from the chamber through the end of the barrel? Correct. And do you remove the the jag or the brush and then pull it back through, or do you no, leave it in there? I don't. I'm not sure where that even ever came from okay. because. Uh, you're not going to ruin the bore by pulling the jag back through because the, the back of it doesn't have any sharp edges or hurt anything. Okay. The whole scrubbing the end of the crown with a bronze brush crazy can round that crown off and cause accuracy problems. Uh -huh. Nylon's not going to do it. Pushing okay. the brush through, I would tell you not to push the brush all the way out and pull it back. Push it to the crown where it's just poking out and then pull back through. Okay. That'd be the best way to do it. And don't get over excited and and do thousands of strokes. You know, ten strokes just to loosen up that carbon is probably fine. Then a wet patch, let that soak in, loosen that stuff up, and then a few dry patches, and you're good to go. Okay. Now let's compare all what we just talked about with uh, a factory barrel. So say somebody doesn't have the money to get into a GA Precision, they want to go out and get a Ruger RPR or something else. Sure. Those barrels are not going to be hand lapped. Correct. correct? No. So how does that change your break-in and cleaning process? So it doesn't change it any. It's just 
again, you kind of point, alluded to it with the blue color. If you're getting a lot of very, very smurf looking blue, you need to clean it a little bit more, let it soak a little bit more. I'm not saying there's not factory barrels that, that clean very well, because there is, but I do know that factories aren't going to spend the kind of money that custom gunsmiths do on tubes. The, the, the reason they're less expensive is because they have to cut costs in different places, but I've seen RPRs that clean very well, I've seen Remingtons that clean very well, I've seen Winchesters that clean very well, but I've also seen all of those three that don't clean very well. Mm -hmm. So it's going to vary a little bit, they're going to break in a little bit in time with shooting. Um, let that color be your guide. Okay. So the same baking process. Okay, Correct. interesting. And uh, this is a very subjective question, but of the factory manufacturers out there, if you were going to recommend a kid that's only got two grand to spend sure. on a complete rifle system with a scope and everything, what uh, what ones have you had good success with or heard good success with? Well, I can tell you up and now, I mean, the, the, the venerable PSS or Remington Varmint was always a great gun. They kind of didn't listen or didn't pay attention to the market. And Ruger came in with a product that... I mean, it's a great product. Yep. It's three lug action, short stroke. It's it's unique. Now, there's nothing else like it. Shoots very well. It's very easy to gunsmith on. Uh, a lot of guys are buying wrenches and doing it themselves at home as far as barrel swaps. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the gun. It's a neat gun. We recommend it quite a bit when guys are on a budget. We we customize them in the shop routinely. There are at this show a lot of new guns where people basically saw what Ruger did. So and we decided, need to get on that. We decided, well, maybe we messed up. Yep. So I know Remington's got a new gun out with a Magpul stock in 260. Something new from them that I think PRS shooters will pick up on. I know. What Savage, did you think about that when they did 260 instead of 6.5 Creed, six Creedmoor? Right. I, I think they made a mistake. I think they should definitely offer both. But I think there's a little for Remington and 260 Remington's are cartridge. That's so I don't necessarily blame them either. But yeah. I think after probably hearing... 10,000 times at the show, why not 6.5 Creedmoor? Maybe they're rethinking that. Yep, yep. They probably saw that coming a little bit, yeah. too. Okay, awesome. All right. I know a lot of us, there's a lot of actions out there. Tell me some of the actions that you've had the most success with that you like to recommend. And sure. Understanding that you have your own action, the Tempest, sure. and, and others. So. so it is subjective, and I'll try to leave like internal subjectiveness out of it. There's Actions are all very similar. They're all based on an old design that the Germans came up with in the, in the 98 Mauser. I would say the better actions now are the ones that have one piece bolts. So your Defiance types, we, we get two actions from Defiance in the Templars. We've had a great success with them. Surgeon came out with a, a one piece action kind of before everyone. It's It's been popular. We do a lot of builds on those. Uh, the Tempest that you mentioned that we designed, uh, there was a lot of people wanting to shoot Accuracy International Rifles, but didn't necessarily like the modular stock back then. People were really more used to shooting stock. a more traditional stock. So I always wanted to come out with an action that was like the AI in three lugs, you know, a, an almost straight out the side bolt handle that uses AW magazines. And that's where the Tempest came from. It actually took me seven years from the idea to, because obviously it's, I'm not a designer, working with CAD's kind of tough, so it took a long time. We finally got something that works really good. Horizon Machine makes it for us, and it's been super popular. I know. Mm -hmm. That's what you're running in competition. Correct. correct. That's why I run in competitions now. I mean, it's obviously it's my design, so I want to promote it. Uh, most of the people that came in this booth this week came in to just see the, the Tempest. I mean, you can see right over there. That's what they're playing with right now in mm -hmm. the booth. It's a, it's a buzz. It's fast, short lock time. Um, it just was a lot of ideas over my whole career shooting, which is very long, that all went into one, and we're really proud of it. We really, th we really think it, it came out great. So, great, excellent. I'm not saying any one action is better than the other. It's really what you plan on doing with it, what you like personally. Um, I guess that's the easiest way to explain that question. Perfect. Just thought of another one, uh, Barrel Life. A lot of guys get on. We made a video about 6 millimeter versus 6.5 versus 308. Sure and was wildly popular, kind of controversial a little bit. I'm curious to hear um, from your perspective, I know barrel life is a little bit subjective because right. you know, depending on what you consider being a, you know, a time to, to switch out another barrel, but what would you say barrel life is in a typical six millimeter, like a 243 and a six Creedmoor and so on versus a 6.5 versus a 308? What do you sure. normally see? So I'll start out with it. It, it sounds easy, well, it sounds like it would be subjective, but actually it's not. It's very scientific. It's, mm -hmm. it's You could almost map out how guns were going to fail if everything was equal. Being, if you fired 
a round per second until the gun failed. Mm -hmm. what, what you can't, the variable that you can't really put in there on any type of test is how is that gun going to be shot? How quick? How yep. rapid? Like you, are you hunting talking with about, it or are you running PRS with it? Correct. Or, you, yeah. or you're going to the range and you're one of those guys that just wears Ranks out a moving it. target for two hours straight mm -hmm. trying to learn how to shoot movers. Uh, I've seen guns and I'll use 65 SOM because I have the best data on that because I collected it all and wanted to know myself before we launched it. Mm -hmm. We've seen guns that shoot out as quick as 900 rounds. Wow. Again, torture test type stuff. Shooting at movers, shooting in matches where you're shooting 20 dot drills in 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of stuff that wears out barrels. If it's a guy that hunts, and I have a, a, a very close friend of mine that shoots that caliber almost exclusively, but he shoots 20 rounds on a weekend at a target, you know, coming up with a new load or a new bullet. Then he goes out during the week and shoots coyotes like one or two a day, no more than three, four, five rounds a day, all year long mm -hmm. for a couple of years. We had a, one of his guns go 3,700 rounds. Wow. So. That's really where the barrel life thing is. Now, of course, a big overbore magnum is going to be shorter than, let's say, a 308. I know 308 bores. We just got one in from a police department. It was a Robar built rifle from back in the 80s. They sent it back for its first barrel, and it was missing six inches of rifle. They claim it still shot. It was just very slow. Hmm. So if the, if the chamber is very straight and the, uni the wear is very uniform, it's like shooting a, a, a gun with a very long throat. It's still going to be accurate. You're just going to lose a lot of that chamber pressure because you're shooting through so much freeboard. Mm -hmm. uh, 308 is going to last a long time. I would say typically 8,000 rounds under normal conditions. Uh, 260, I would say normally is a 4,000 round cartridge under normal conditions, but I've seen those. I had a friend of mine, Marty from Badge Ordnance, that took one on a prairie dog hunting trip. It's a very good one. Mm -hmm. He had magazines loaded up and was shooting prairie dogs as fast as he could get on the trigger. He came back and that thing was completely toast. Done. Hmm. So I don't know the exact round count, but he estimates it was 900 to 1,000 rounds wow. and it was completely gone. So Running real hard. Again, it's scientific in the fact that if you knew exactly how fast you were shooting and what caliber you were shooting, you could map out when it was going to fail. Yep. But the variable is the shooter and how he actually shoots. So. Okay. And like a six millimeter, what would you say is normally a, Norm like a 243 or right. a six speed one? I would say most guys in match shooting are getting 1,700 rounds. Uh, depending on the matches the guy shoots, if it's matches with slower round counts, like let's say the Oklahoma matches where it's troop lines, there's nothing super fast. If that's all he shot, he would not get 2,800 rounds. Hmm. I've had a team shooter that doesn't like the speed shoots. They go, he shoots a lot of the longer range shoots, and he got 3,100 rounds out of his. So again, it's... And do they tend to drop off really quickly, or is it more of a small fall apart? I assume it's kind of right. a gradual thing. But. The same thing I was just mentioning. You can always, the gun that's typically still shooting bug holes, but it's slower, your dope's not the same. If you were to shoot and chrono that before the match, up your powder charge and get it back to where you wanted, it would last a couple more matches. Then you're going to have to, when they start wearing out, you're going to have to start paying more attention to them, you know, upping the powder charge to get the velocity you want. And then when you're finally out of case capacity or you're just sick of putting a lot more powder in the case, it's time to get a rebarrel done. Gotcha. You typically don't just see a gun go from shooting like this to shooting like this. Yeah, overnight. Sure. Really what Figured. you get is a gun that's shooting 3,100 feet a second and it's now shooting 2,915. Mm. And that starts to bug the shooter and he just wants a new tube on. There. Gotcha. It's very rare a shooter says, it's just not shooting anymore. I think that's a tough concept for a lot of newer guys to understand that the barrel is really a consumable item that's right. going to wear out and you get a new one and the gun shoots great right. again. It's also funny that I've seen a lot of shooters that don't shoot matches or don't understand that, that see that drop in feet per second and they just want a new barrel in their gun. Yeah. It's, it's not really that, ne that necessary and you can set the barrel back one turn and or a couple turns, get that throat fresh and closer to the yep. cartridge and that, that You're basically pressure. basically cutting it and rechambering it. Correct. They call it a setback, uh, rechambers is what some guy called it, some guys have called it, but it sets the throat back towards the bullet, brings that pressure up a little bit and the speed comes back. So it's normally a hundred dollar fix instead of a new barrel and new and new smithing, which is you know four fifty to five fifty okay. fix. So, so if somebody would, sends you an action and just wants to get it barreled and chambered, what do you typically charge or something like that? So if they provide depends the on the action. If it's a if it's a true you know factory action like a Defiant Stiller Surgeon that doesn't need any work on it, it's two hundred fifty dollars for the install, one hundred twenty five to thread for your muzzle device, and. Uh, 
You know, any coating you would want on it would be above and beyond that. If it's a Remington and it's the first time it's been there and it's a factory gun, we're going to charge another $100 to true that action. Both the front of the action, the, the lug seats, the threads, will align the, the holes on top to your scope base is dead center of the receiver and coaxial from front to back. So Okay. That, and what's your turnaround time right now for a, a complete build? <laughs> Because you guys are a big operation right. compared to most, so you're cranking them out that, a little it, bit better. But that you're is, also a lot more popular. That is very subjective because it depends on if we have the stock they want in stock. If everything's barrel, all together, ready to go. Yeah, four to six months. Okay, very good. Very if good. it's just a rebarrel or they send their parts and they want the barrel installed, two to three months. Cool, very good. All right, I have one last question here. What was it like to play the part of Shmi on the book, the movie Disney's Hook? <laughs> Yeah, I've seen that picture rolling around a little bit. I broke the internet with this picture a few weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, everyone posts that picture around there. That is not <laughs> me, but uh, maybe it's my long lost brother I don't know about. Love that movie. It was on a few weeks ago, and I was like, I got to throw that on Instagram. And somebody <laughs> saw it and was like, oh, you broke the internet with that one. Well, we really appreciate you having a sense of humor and giving us some time here. And uh, and maybe real quick, I mean, tell us uh, maybe a little bit about some of the rifles that are, that are sure. new or new features that you guys have that we should be excited about. Well, in this rack, we have the HRT rifle that we built for the HRT team for the FBI about six years ago. That's uh, got a nice heavy barrel on that. That's a, Yeah, it's that's number a, seven M24 Contour, McMillan A5 stock. I'm sorry, um, A3-5 stock. Uh, this stock was actually designed for the HRT team by McMillan. Huh. It's got a Badger ERF, um, ERF system for night vision. It's a 20-minute rail. Sell a lot of these guns. Are they still running 308? They're still running 308. Gotcha. Um, this is a 300 Win Mag. It's our Hospitaller rifle. A lot of the SF guys shoot 300 Win Mag. Yeah. They buy guns from us, and so this is a gun that guys you know typically around SF units are they buying their popular. own gun or are they able to request no, a lot one of, from... A lot of guys are getting into shooting. They want to shoot what they're used to or what they work with in the military. So, gotcha. You know, it's surprising to me too, but a lot of guys still buy 300 wind mags. So yeah. this gun's pretty popular. And this is your caliber. defiance action, right? Correct. That's the Defiance V2. It's the full integrated rail. Okay. Uh, we also split this rail for more hunting applications like you see up here on top. Okay. It's still a one-piece rail, but it's split more hunter style. Okay. This is the temp. This is a team gun in Tempest with a Tempest action, a number six gap contour, which is what we typically call our team contour. What barrel are you guys shooting in your team rifles? It's this this exact gun. That is the team rifle. And it's That's, by Bartlein or who, who's it's, the, all of our barrels are from Bartlein. The, okay. the only other barrel maker we use routinely is Gary Schneider, and that's okay. for our military builds. We want to keep our military builds exactly like the military gets them, so we use Schneider barrels on the Marine Corps M40A1, A3, and A5 rifles. And are you building those rifles for the Marines? And others no. are more their personal rifles. No, so I have three Marine Corps armors in my shop. Together, all three have 51 years experience building M40s for the Marine Corps. And so because of that experience and because we've kind of always been known for it, uh, we sell a lot of uh, replicas. They're absolutely... 100% Marine Corps spec. You could hide it in with the Marine Corps Armory guns, and they wouldn't even it wouldn't know the difference. So, huh. very cool. This is uh, a hybrid hunter. It's a number four contour on an on the EH1 stock, which is very similar to a typical tactical stock, but it's very light, made of carbon fiber. This would be that gun when a guy calls and says, "Hey, I can only afford one gun. I want to hunt with it and shoot targets in PRS matches." This is the gun we tell them to get. It's, it's, it's kind of a medium way. You could go both ways with it. Very cool. Well, you make some beautiful, beautiful rifles. I've witnessed them uh, shoot some amazing <laughs> things myself. Um, our buddy Corey Dickerson from uh, Stainless Telling Media. Yeah, sure. Uh, he's actually kind of one that got me really started with this and making videos okay. and things. He took his uh, 7WSM that Moon right. uh, used to be with you guys uh, built and was shooting that thing out to like two grand. Yeah, and sure. just the groups were... Unbelievable! Yeah, he makes some awesome videos. I so. talk with I talk with him quite a bit. He's got a six five psalm now that he's really happy with. And he's got about everything. Yeah, I think he does. I think you're right. He's got he's a whole safe. He's a fun connoisseur. Stuff. That he is. Well, I appreciate it very much, George. Thank uh, you for giving us the time and have yep. a safe trip home. Uh, take care. Thanks, guys.
So here we are at SHOT Show 2016. Got Todd McGee from Dead Air Armament. Hi, I'm Kelly McMillan. We're gonna give it a shot right now. 